Christopher Columbus has been accused of bringing slavery and genocide to the indigenous people of the Americas, especially the Caribbean islands where he first landed and explored. Is this true? Yes, I'm sorry to say, there is a lot of truth in it, but the reality behind the truth is not simple. Let's look at how European slavery got started in the New World and try to understand why it happened. We can reference a couple of books that provide the background and details of what happened, starting with the slave trade in Africa. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to arrive on Africa's west coast. And the explorer Antoa Goncalves became the first Portuguese to buy slaves there. They considered themselves entitled to own slaves by papal decree. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V authorized the Portuguese king to enslave Saracens, that is, Muslims, pagans, and any other unbelievers, an entitlement he confirmed in a papal bull, or decree, three years later. The early Portuguese slave trade assumed several forms, from inherited slavery to engendered servitude. This was the form of slavery with which Columbus was familiar. His experience with the Portuguese slave trade prepared him to look on the Central American Indians he encountered as potential slaves. Were they energetic? cooperative, strong enough to endure crossing the Atlantic and colder climates? Were they more valuable as slaves or as Christian converts? This last question becomes very important later. One of Columbus's biggest critics was Bartolome de las Casas, a Catholic priest who personally witnessed much of the violence during and after Columbus's governorship in the New World. He even wrote an entire book about it in the early 16th century. Among other complaints, he described how the Christians responded to native violence by murdering and torturing their antagonists, not respecting the human and divine justice and natural law under those whose authority they did it. There is no denying the force of La Casas's outrage, but the Indians of Hispaniola the old name for the island of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, were not the innocence of his imagination. They had been slaveholders long before the Europeans arrived. Historian Fernandez de Oviedo noted that in war, contesting Indian tribes take captives whom they brand and keep as slaves. Each master has his own brand, and some masters pull out one front tooth of their slaves as a mark of ownership. The National Geographic documentary Lost Fleet of Columbus reads a quote from the letters of Michele de Cuneo, an Italian adventurer and friend of Christopher Columbus, where he describes the failed search for gold riches. Several times we fished in those rivers, but never found by anyone a single grain of gold. For this reason, we are very displeased with the local Indians. The gold that had seemed to glisten in every riverbed and hillside had run out. Columbus and his men had picked the mines and waterways clean. To justify his continued presence and his rich entitlements, he turned to the resource of last resort, slaves. In a memorandum of February 1494, during Columbus's second voyage to and first governorship over Hispaniola, Columbus had outlined a plan for a regular trade in Carib slaves in order to pay for supplies, as the Caribs were mortal enemies of their Highness's new subjects, the Tainos. Such traffic would be legitimate and even politic. This traffic would focus on the menacing Caribs, thereby allowing the more peaceful Tainos to remain in place, and it would last until the gold mines functioned. With gold in short supply, the slave trade gradually took on greater urgency. The sovereigns of Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, no strangers to cruelty, kept their distance from the idea, which was certain to offend the church, political rivals, and even their own sense of morality. They wrote to him, This subject has been postponed for the present until another voyage has come thence, and let the Admiral Columbus, 
write what he thinks about it. Ignoring the sentiment expressed in this response, Columbus set about establishing a slave trade, including both Caribs and Tainos. Despite his intermittent regard for the more peaceful of the two tribes, he would send them all to the busy and profitable slave market in Seville, Spain. According to Michele de Cuneo, Columbus ordered the seizure of 1,500 men and women on Hispaniola. Of these, 500 deemed the most desirable for slave trade were confined to one of four caravels, or ships, bound for Spain. The admiral had neglected to advise the ship captains of the optimal route back to Europe. They drifted for several weeks before working their way north to catch the trade winds to push them home to Spain. It was a hellish crossing. About 200 of these Indians died, I believe because of the unaccustomed air, colder than theirs, Michele de Cuneo wrote. Half the surviving Indians were seriously ill by the time they disembarked at Cadiz, Spain. The fleet's overall manager sent the survivors to Seville to be auctioned off. A witness later wrote, they are not very profitable since almost all died, for the country did not agree with them. Queen Isabel's response to receiving slaves from the Caribbean islands is dramatized in the TV series titled Isabel. Her outrage may be exaggerated, but the sentiment seems accurate. The situation got even worse during Columbus's third voyage too, and second governorship over Hispaniola. In order to defray the expenses of colonization, since the gold takings during his absence had as usual been disappointing, he proposed to send in the name of the Holy Trinity all the slaves that can be sold. Spain had enslaved the Canarians of the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, and Portugal the Africans. Why make an exception of the Indians? Some of Columbus's own people disliked the policy, especially those who came to convert the natives to Christianity. A priest later testified that Columbus ordered them not to baptize Indians without express permission. Instead, Columbus permitted the Spaniards to take the Indians as slaves to be bought and sold rather than baptized. No longer were the souls to be saved. They were human commodities whose value would be decided by Columbus. The Queen was disappointed with the small returns in the saving of souls and offended by Columbus's repeated flouting of her wishes by shipping slaves home. So the policy and acts of Columbus, for which he alone was responsible, began the depopulation of the terrestrial paradise that was Hispaniola in 1492. Here I'd like to interject my doubts that paradise means living in a jungle with nothing but Stone Age technology, surrounded by poisonous animals and violent tribes. Though clearly, there are others who disagree. And of course, the tribes of the Caribbean did not ask for the destruction brought on them by the hunt for gold, colonization, and the slave trade. Columbus himself expressed his regrets in the last few years of his life, though his writings show more regret for missed opportunities than those who suffered so much. Near the end of his life, he filled the idle hours fretting about his lost income from the Indies, explaining that the Indians were and are the island's real wealth. He was disturbed to hear that six out of every seven Indians had died as a direct result of inhumane treatment. The expression of regret did not lead to a mea culpa, an acknowledgement of one's fault or error, as might be expected. Rather, a great deal of income had been lost. Spain's income and his. He offered a similarly shallow excuse for his sending ships filled with slaves back to Spain. He had intended them to convert to the Holy Faith and then return to Hispaniola where they could pass all they had learned to their kin. This of course never happened. In the documentary Columbus, The Lost Voyage, Columbus dies a broken man. His last words are a prayer to God.
It would take another 300 years for Britain and later the United States of America to begin the war against slavery in the Americas, Europe, and North Africa. Today, the blood of the Tainos only exists mingled with that of the Africans, who were imported to do the work that they, the Tainos, could not and would not perform. At least we can be thankful that they and their culture survived. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel for new videos every week or two, and see the description below for a list of books, online references, and films featured in this video.